Hi, so I've got um, two questions. So first, um, could you go back and finish your PhD, Ben? <laughs> could you go back and finish it? Could you write up everything and then say, yeah, I've done my PhD now. It took me like 10 years, but I've done it. And that's one for you, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I was going to test him because he's got two pages of equations in this oh. book. <laughs> and I was going to really scare me and say, you know, this is like your PhD viva. You know, on page nine, you have an equation. Can you derive that equation for us? <laughs> it's uh, not too late, I is it? I think it's probably... Brian May went Brian back and May finished. did it. Now, yeah. listen, to, you know, I, the, the area that I did my PhD in, which was solid-state physics, has sort of moved on. Uh, considerably, and the um, I um, I did my PhD on this thing called uh, Coulomb blockade. Basically, if you make um, the idea is uh, if you make a really small capacitor, and I mean really small, a capacitor so small that only one electron you can, you know imagine you know, you know a capacitor basically two charged plates. And you use it, a bit like the cell we were talking about, actually. You use it to separate charge and create an electric field and thereby store energy. It's how we store en electrical energy in most of the electrical devices that we, that we use. So what would happen if you... My PhD was what would happen if you made that as small as you could possibly make it. So small you could only fit one electron on it at, at a time. Sadly, <laughs> that is like... That's so old hat now. <laughs> that would be, um, yeah, that would be like, you kind of say, I've invented this thing called electricity. <laughs> um, now, how lucky is Brian May? Because not only was he in <laughs> Queen, which I think was pretty lucky to start with, he did his PhD in this thing called zodiacal dust. Now, um, as we were saying, 20 years ago, no one was remotely interested in um, whether there might be other solar systems around other stars. And zodiacal dust is the dust that sits in a solar system and obscures the star. Now everyone's absolutely fascinated now. Oh, yeah, Brian May comes along, finishes his PhD off. <laughs> um, suddenly the hero, oh, yeah, well done, Brian. Oh, you've solved it all for us. Thank you so much. And then he goes back to being in Queen. It's so Life's not frustrating. Fair. And then here I, here I am scrabbling around, you know, for the bits that fall off Jim Alcalili's table. Uh, dear me. No, I don't think I could. But um, uh, that doesn't mean I don't, in my idle moments, just pretend that I maybe could and that I could have a PhD. You said you had two questions, so what was the second? Yeah. Is it true you can really talk to crows? Because I watched Would I Lie to You quite recently. And ah. Is it true? <clears throat> it is absolutely true uh, that you can talk to crows. They won't necessarily understand much of what you're saying. <laughs> um, but uh, crows... Don't, no, there isn't a really important... It's part of... You know, I was saying, well, you know, funnily enough, we think we're unique in so many ways, but... Corvids, the family to which crows belong, are a really fascinating example of another... Now, the common ancestor of mammals and birds, you go, you know, you go way, way back, um, possibly before the you know, Permian extinction. I mean, it's a long time ago uh, that we shared a common ancestor. It's probably in some sort of amphibious creature. I, I, w I wouldn't even know. But it is, you know... That's a long, long, long time ago. And they've developed cognitive... They've developed the same kind of problem-solving intelligence that we have. And Is that the theory of mind? The, the, they have theory of, of mind. Aware so of they're themselves. able to... There's a series of experiments. My favourite is um, the Crow Motel. Do you know this one? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're laughing. I don't know what that yeah. means. They know about it or they just don't believe you. You're just going to make stuff up. A couple of people have stayed in it. I think, <laughs> but the, uh, the Crow Motel, you have three rooms, OK? So there's a... Um, essentially, there's the lobby and there's, bedroom, there's bedroom one and bedroom two. So some days, the crows, uh, if they go to sleep in bedroom one, they get breakfast in the morning. They go to sleep in bed, bedroom two, no breakfast in the morning. Um, the crow ends up hungry. So 
what the, what the crows do, if you the crows are great at sort of hiding and caching food. It's one of the things, one of their behaviours that, that they really exploit in all these experiments. So basically, what they did was then, after establishing this, so the crow goes, oh, right, bedroom one, breakfast, bedroom two, no breakfast. They give the crow some food during the day. The crow would go and hide the food in the room where it wouldn't get breakfast. <laughs> in other words, it was... Ca the, um, not only do crows have a theory of mind in that they, they are um, capable of hiding food from other crows and treating other, they are dis capable of deceiving other crows, mm -hmm. but they also have a mental time travel. They're capable of, they're capable of thinking, OK, well, I'm going to have that room tonight, so and I've got a couple of hazelnuts here, so on. They are capable of thinking into the future and placing themselves in the future and anticipating future behaviour, which is not something... I mean, once you know that, you think, well, big deal. But that's not something anybody thought that animals were... Um, at one stage, anyone thought that uh, animals, particularly crows, were, were capable of doing. And there's been a similar suite of experiments that were done on chimpanzees, and it's really interesting that they see that they see a lot of parallels between crow intelligence and chimpanzee intelligence. And if anything, the, cr the crows come out slightly ahead. <laughs> it is incredible. Yeah. And, and the idea of talking to, you mentioned talking to crows. Talking, so yeah. There's, so there's the talking to, to, to Talking to crows. So I went to meet this professor, Nikki Clayton. Um, she has, uh, she absolutely loves, she's just totally in love with uh, crows. These northern scrub jays that she, uses, uh, does these sort of psych experiments on. And she does talk to them, and they recognise her. And she could explain to me, when the crow, she would call this crow, the crow would come over, and one basic thing I hadn't realised about crow behaviour is I always thought, when a crow sort of does that, it's actually looking at the person here. Mm. So you kind of think, <laughs> you think they're daft, because you're sort of st standing there, and they're going... <laughs> <laughs> But actually, they're, they're really giving you the beady eye. Just, you just don't know it. And it was really interesting, just a few keys to crow behaviour, and you suddenly start to see how intelligent they are and that they're communicating with one another. And, she, and Nikki was explaining to me, now they're telling, now he's telling the other crows that you're here and he doesn't recognise you, that I'm here, and now he's telling... And then you could see the other crows sort of going, is he, what does he look like? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I recognise him. <laughs> anyway, um, the dolphins, this is a fantastic... I mean, our obsession with language is, is, is fascinating. And again, it's the way we try and sort of impose our own ideas of how you should communicate on other intelligent creatures on our own planet. And it's this fascinating series of experiments. Jim mentioned the dolphins. So what SETI... Um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, when it was first founded in the very early 60s, they did a number of experiments on dolphins, where they tried to teach dolphins to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, one researcher filled... Um, they had a, um, a kind of a little uh, dolphin sort of reserve. They filled a house with water, and she cohabited with a dolphin to spend on it because she felt that a bit like... There was some theory behind this. There was a, an idea that um, children at the time, in the 60s, it was believed that children learned to speak through immersive contact with mm. a mother. That was how... We now know that that's not the way that language is acquired, that, and that it's more sort of hardwired than that. But it was believed at the time immersive contact with a mother was how all of us picked up our language and they believed, well, OK, we need immersive contact between a dolphin and a, a mother figure. She sort of painted lipstick on her lips so she could... Uh, the dolphin could see the shape her lips was making. Uh, and she attempted to teach the dolphin to use its blowhole to speak English. Um, and... and um, it didn't work, obviously. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that didn't... Uh, the, fact, the fact that it didn't work was not immediately apparent to the researchers. They, they really believed that they were making progress and this dolphin was learning mm. to, to speak English. It's a kind of... Um, it's, a, it's a cautionary tale in some <laughs> ways. Um, there's a happier... 
well, not, not a conclusion, not a happy conclusion to that story, but um, SETI are currently, many people in SETI are now doing really great research on dolphin language. And there's a fantastic SETI researcher called Lawrence Doyle, who is using um, maths, basically. He's using the maths of language to show that dolphin whistles have the mathematical properties that language, that human language has. So it's not proof that dolphins are, have a language to communicate with one another, but it's um, certainly encouraging, you know, mm. fascinating. Yes. Hi, Ben. Um, you mentioned that you hope to see some kind of signal over the next 10 years of alien life to not, for us to receive some kind of signal. Yeah. Um, and that would be great. That would be brilliant. But at least for now, we have no confirmed proof of alien life. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard of what's called the, the Fermi paradox, which can be broadly summarized as if intelligent life does exist, then where are they? Uh, and there are a lot of answers to this, whether it be that the distances involved are just too great, maybe, as we've talked about today, the conditions required for life are just too difficult. Um, what's your take on this, and what do you think is the most likely answer? Um, well, in terms of signal, I mean, to be specific, what I'm talking about is picking up the spectra of, you know, is looking at the atmosphere, being able to image is not, is not the quite, right, quite the right word, because to be able to pick up the spectra of uh, the gases in, an a in, in the atmosphere of an alien planet and to be able to say, for example, there's, that oxygen is out of, you know, there shouldn't be oxygen on that planet. It would be out of chemical balance with the other gases that are there. Something must be driving, something must be driving that atmosphere. Life is, a possi life is one of the things that possibly drives it. Um, so that's the kind of signal that I'm talking about. I don't expect to receive... Um, I think we should keep looking. And the search is certainly hotting up. You know, I mean, we're going to search the nearest million... Um, uh, the nearest million sun-like stars within the next decade. So, I mean, even if you sort of roughly do the numbers on how many alien civilizations you might hope there would be, you probably need to search more like... 10 or 100 million stars before you find a signal. But still, searching a million is a decent fraction. We're sort of getting somewhere. This isn't a, mm. a 10,000 or 100,000 anymore. This is a, de a decent fraction of the number that we would need to search. But my own... Um, the Fermi paradox is basically, um, as, as you said, if aliens exist, intelligent aliens exist, where are they? Where are all the aliens? You know, surely they should be here by now. And there have been some great calculations done by Paul Davis that shows um, you really don't need to... Sp intelligent life really wouldn't need to spread that quickly throughout a galaxy uh, in order to um, populate it. You know, I mean, it's talking, you're talking of the order of millions of years for intelligent life to populate a galaxy. So where are they? Um, my um, answer to that is that I believe it to be a timing, a timing problem. So it's just a question that it, it is, you hinted at it in your question, it's to do with civilizations don't last that long. Civilizations that use the same technologies as us are rare. Intelligent life is rare in itself. So by the time, you know, if, if a light switches on over, you know, if the lights go on on this planet over here, they've gone out by the time the lights go on on this planet over there. You know, I mean, we've, you know, in, in cosmic terms, the... 50 or so years that we've been, um, well, I suppose 100 years that the planet's been lit up, but you know, 50 years or so we've been broadcasting electromagnetic signals of a decent strength. But is that because you think, you know, civilizations will ultimately just destroy themselves or they will evolve I beyond they, the physical I need just think to they send signals to each other? Technology is just, you know, it was the, it's not the civil, I don't believe it's that civilizations. <coughs> fall, I think it's just technologies are very, very short-lived. You know, we're already, you know, arguably, we're already into a third phase of, of technology in, in our own communication. We started with, you know, just splurging radio um, waves into the sky, didn't we? And then we went to cable. We sing, sing electro, sent our signals along cable. Cable's not, not very detectable from space, you know. So we, we were bright, you know, in terms of electromagnetic signals, bright for probably only what was it by the time we started cables? Probably in the 80s, 90s. Mm. So we only had about 30, 
40 years, if you, count, if you, if you count sort of beginning in the late 30s as the first really strong radio signals and had gone by the late 80s, 50 years, it's not a long time. And then we went to cable, didn't we? That's not a huge amount of leakage. There's not a lot of signal for anyone mm. to see. Um, and now, or arguably, we're sort of moving over to optical. You know, we're tending to use lasers more to, mm. for our uh, really long-distance communication. So, you know, now, now the aliens have got to start looking for lasers. Um, that's probably <laughs> going to last 50 years, and there'll be something else we'll be using, you know, mm. neutron beams or whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? It's good. I just think mm. the technologies don't last that long, so it's a timing it's problem. Good. Whatever you're looking for... I mean, 50 years, you know, that was, a very, that was a very, very short window, you know, when it's, you know, the nearest, you know, there's probably a lot further than 50 light years to the nearest civilization. Mm. You know, it, it's a timing, it's a timing thing, I think. I, do, I, do, I just think people, I, I, I'm not, the Paul Davis argument that they should have be here and there, you know, they would have populated the galaxies, I, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I don't think, I think, again, as you're, as your technology Im improves, I don't know that I don't know that you really have the n the need or the necessity to travel outside your own solar system. And the distance between solar systems is so unimaginably large. I think that's a that's a real problem. I think travelling within a solar system, and we, we've done it ourselves. But I'm not so convinced. I, I, that doesn't dishearten me. I think they're out there. It's just they're not out. You know, it's just a timing thing. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? We show up with the red carnation. We go. Not, not, not no. coming. A crow looks at us. <laughs> <laughs> decides against it. We, we, we head off. Then an alien shows up with a red carnation. It's, like, it's, just, it's just timing, I think. Missing each other. Yeah. <laughs> OK, let's have some more questions. Oh, look at that. Are you shooting? Thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned before about us making assumptions like they, the, you, you talk about the size of the holes on the meteor and saying about the DNA, assuming that it would be a DNA-based life, and it may not be. Have they done any work into what other forms life might take if it's not sort of DNA, carbon-based? Are, are there other forms it could take? And have they looked into that? Yeah. Well, I mean, yes, lots. I mean, the uh, D DNA appears to have, you know... DNA really uh, chemically looks very like two strands of RNA sort of fused together. RNA is the kind of, you know, basically if, if the cell is a kitchen, RNA is the chef and DNA is the cookbook. You know, it's RNA that does all the, all the work in, our, in, our, uh, in the biology of life, life on Earth. So we already know there was another kind of life before ours, which was RNA, arguably... RNA type life that's that's life but nothing not necessarily as we would rec recognize it with maybe a different suite of long chain molecules involved but but RNA the the prime suspect would have been there there's a it's amazing work being done with I mean Craig Venter all kinds of people doing amazing work where they take DNA and they try and attach um, they try and alter it you know so we're taking the basic template of DNA and Messing around with it, seeing what you know, what they can they can make artificial kinds of DNA, and they've done that. Mm. What we do know is you is you do. I mean, or what everyone the assumption that everyone is making is just that it would be. You need a reasonably long chain molecule because it's got to carry a lot of information, and it's got to be able to make copies of itself. That's basically, as far as we've got. There's no, you know, there's nothing to say. It has to be. It has to be RNA. I people, don't yeah, think. people forget that, don't they? It's not yeah. just the, the, the complexity of the structure of the building blocks of life. It's the fact that it needs to be able to hold information, the yeah. instruction manual to make, to make life. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's, that, it's uh, the amount of information the, it needs the, to contain. The, the coding it? aspect of it, the yeah. software, is, is needed as well for life. Yeah, you know. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Hi, um, not quite Dr. Ben Miller. Um, <laughs> this is a bit they're you, getting a bit always cheeky, with aren't they? the PhD. <laughs> Look at that! Look at that! <laughs> the thickness of that. <laughs> Most of that was copied from more than one book. <laughs> um, um, you were on about the communications um, thing, and I'm just thinking, like, 
they say that if they are intelligent, then they're going to be like thousands or millions of years ahead of us. Yeah. But SETI are looking for infrared signals, and we're like basically already beyond that. So I'm just thinking like maybe they're using something a lot more advanced, like we can't detect something like quantum entanglement or something like that to send information between, you know, stars or things if they're that advanced. Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we're looking for classical you know, what you might call classical inf information, aren't we? You know, we're looking for, you know, something like the, <clears throat> you know, the digital information that we broadcast. But we're already on the, you know, hopefully on the brink of, you know, a new era in, you know, quantum electronics of using uh, a whole different kinds of ways of encoding our information. Yeah, I mean... I think it harks back to what we were talking about with the technology. I mean, if you can kind of think of the, um, the way that we encode our information is another of those things that it can, keeps changing, you know, like the radio dishes and to the cables, to the lasers. I think this is just one of the, one of the difficulties. Um, also, why would they be signalling to us? <laughs> you, you, you know, it's... No, no, none of the communication we, we, we use now is, is spreads out over the entire mm -hmm. galaxy. It's all very directional, isn't it? You know, we kind of... And that's what you do. And once you've got... You use your energy as efficiently as possible. I don't know. I mean... Yeah, I mean, it, it does put a limit on how, how far away uh, an alien civilization can be for it to know that we are there to receive signals. Because we've been chucking out radio signals for the last yeah. 100 years, say, or less than that. Yeah, uh, yeah So it's yeah. got to get time to the end. They've got to catch, receive it and then send something back. So they can't be any more than 40 or, or 50 light years away uh, from us. Uh, otherwise, they're just sending out, transmitting stuff, you know, in the dark, in the hope that's like us, in the hope that someone would pick yeah, it up. And, and, and in which case, you're right. They'll and pick you're up absolutely all sorts right. Of... Statistically, they're likely to be much more advanced yeah. than we yeah. are. Statistically, that's absolutely true. Um, it's a bit like, you know, to go back to the ant civilization, it's a bit like us seeing that ants have left a sort of trail of formic acid on the ground and thinking, oh, maybe we should send them a signal. Do you know what I mean? I think, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think possibly they sort of, you know, we are just some mould on a, on a planet over there that's not even really that interesting as far as, as, far as they're concerned, yeah. I mean, that's the, if they still inhabit physical bodies. <laughs> <laughs> at all, <laughs> and don't just sort of uh, upload themselves into some sort of intergalactic internet. I mean, it's kind of, this is one of the wonderful things, I think, about the whole subject. It makes you think about what, what fundamentally is life. You know, what is it? You know, what is it that we're actually looking for in the most basic terms? Is it company? Is it really to know that we're not alone? You know, are we looking for our parents? Um... You know, are we, are we searching for ghosts? You know, I think it goes to something very deep. It's something very deep and primal about the whole thing. But we need to look, don't we? We need to look. We need to know. Good. We have one question. Well, we have two questions up, up there. Then Ooh. we'll come to the gentleman over there. And um, we've got about 10 minutes left, so we'll uh, mm. see if we can squeeze in as many as possible. Yeah. This question actually comes from the OCR Physics GCSE that was sat last year. Um, ah, two uh, one. <laughs> two one. Yeah. <laughs> so you great, better guys. be able to answer it. <laughs> Love you. Buy the book. Um, OK, OK. Yeah, good. Looking forward it, to this. It was, do we, should we send out... Um, signals to aliens and I'll just say most of the people I talked to who sat it said that they said no because they might attack us yeah. I think that's a little bleak <laughs> <laughs> um, I, first of all we are sending them out anyway so I don't think we need to really worry about that um, you know that, that balloon you know that ever expanding sphere of radio waves is, is out there admittedly it's not that strong um, but, it's, but it's out there. Um, so certainly anything probably within, you know, within a few tens of light years of the Earth already, already, knows, already knows about us anyway, and they're the only ones close enough to do any real damage, surely. So it's, <laughs> it's already over, I think, as far as if, uh, if they're going to come and get us. But no, I think we should send signals. Um, 
In fact, um, when you get into get uh, get into information theory a little bit in the um, in the book, and you know what becomes apparent really really quickly is there's no not much point sending a message. You just got to send just you just need to send a lot of just a lot of data. You've got to send a lot of stuff because the chances of ever being able to uh, decode or make any sense of it is um, is slim. So the more you've got to work on, the better. Um, I think what we send should be honest. You know, I think we try. I think it's an important exercise for ourselves to, um, you know, to try and kind of take our global organisations and our our own species more seriously to to, to attempt to communicate with other civilizations. And I think we should try and be honest. We should try and not paint this picture of ourselves as 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 we would like to be seen. Um, and there, uh, Seth Shostak um, one, uh, of SETI has a really great argument uh, where he says we should just send the entire internet. Um, <laughs> obviously not my stuff. Yeah, um, no, that's <laughs> mainly yours. But, uh, but yeah, the idea being, you know, we should just, you know, here we are. This is us, you know, warts and all. This is, this is a... I've got some old pictures on Facebook where I'd had a few bit too much to drink and I <laughs> would, would rather not. <laughs> Aliens saw that. Yeah. But yes, I think we should. Yeah. There was another question. Um, I think it was, you had your hand up, didn't you? Yes. Um, I know there's another one up there, but I've promised him first. We'll see if we've got time. Yeah. Uh, earlier you were saying about how minuscule the chances for another carbon-based life form to be in the solar system, not the solar system, the galaxy. Uh, what about silicon-based life forms? Because we don't really know how they form or how they work. Do you have any idea about the chance of them forming? Um, I'm, you know, I know, I know there is that argument about... <laughs> I've never, I'm, I don't know about you, but I don't see an awful lot of, the earth is mainly made of silicon, right? That's, there's a lot of silicon around. I don't see a lot of silicon chemistry. I mean, I know, I mean, I, I admit this is, <laughs> this is a bit of a, a hand-waving response, but carbon is amazing. It is pretty special, where, as, as something to make complicated molecules. Absolutely yeah. extraordinary, and carbon, Chemistry in water is just off the charts brilliant. Carbon chemistry in conjunction with all the metals that we find on the earth, amazing, you know. Uh, it's just, carbon is just such a gift. I just don't see, and also, when you look at the way the universe is set up, the odds against there being any carbon molecules at all if you were designing the universe from scratch, are pretty minimal. It's down to, again, um, the same Fred Hoyle who said um, the chances of uh, assembling a self-reproducing molecule in a puddle were the same as a, a wind blowing through a junkyard and assembling a, a 747. That same Fred Hoyle um, made his name, really, by predicting a certain, uh, a certain resonance, a certain nuclear resonance. Basically, what happens... Uh, in the, when, when stars, in fusion in stars, it's very hard to make anything um, really much bigger than helium, uh, apart from this amazing reaction where th uh, called the triple alpha reaction, where three helium nuclei can come together. If two of the nuclei happen, when two of those helium nuclei come together, there just happens to be a, a resonance at exactly the right um, energy level for a third carbon molecule to, if you like, take advantage of that resonance and join together to get these three carbon molecules, three helium nuclei to fuse together to create a carbon nucleus. That is like a f really weird freak accident. So it feels like we're in a universe that was tailor-made for carbon and, and heavier elements to exist. Um, you know, really, it's a complete fluke. Really, there should just be nothing really around. You know, it should be just small elements, really. There should be nothing above sort of whatever, <laughs> lithium, boron. There should be nothing more than that. But, but for this one freak resonance that happens in nuclear fusion in stars. That's correct. I just well, you're, you're, 
<laughs> oh my God, I'm explaining nuclear physics. Yeah, that what is the correct doing? explanation. What am well I done. doing? No, no, I've, I've got I'm, a nuclear physicist I'm here. very proud of you, Ben. What am I doing? I, I feel that's warm, warm, warm feeling. Oh, yes, that's correct. <laughs> that's really embarrassing. No, no, it's not. It's fine. Ask Jim will explain. No, no, it's your no, show. Sorry, and and you've, just, you've just given the correct explanation. That's <laughs> very correct. Without that, without the whole resonance, we wouldn't be here. Yeah, without the carbon resonance, we wouldn't be here. And... The chemistry of carbon, this is just something we should all just get a lot more excited about. It's absolutely... Think Come of all on, the other people. stuff. <laughs> all the other stuff lying around, it does nothing. It rusts and that's it. You know, carbon is just bonding with every, every single other stuff. It forms, you know, it can... You know, we've only recently discovered we can... We can make graphene and stuff like that. There's, a really other, there's no limit to the amount of weird stuff that carbon will make. Silicon, I, I see sand. <laughs> um, I know you melt it down, you get glass. But, you know, I mean, I've not seen it do anything. <laughs> well, I know it's chips. the same, you know, I know it's the same uh, group in the periodic table and everything, but, I mean, you've got to give me a bit more than that. So it's Sem semiconductors. Semiconductors. Mm, mm. A bit of doping. Yeah. That's about bit. it. Yeah. That's about <laughs> it. A few interesting, you know, uh, you know, so some electrons can occasionally drift around. If you make it really, really pure and you spend a fortune building equipment to, <laughs> you know, get exactly the pr precise amounts of the doping chemicals that you need, you can get silicon to do something mildly interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, do you have a microphone? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you touched on like Darwinism earlier, and what do you think would be the actual impact tomorrow if we discovered, well, if we came in contact with intelligent life or like bacterial, like what realistically would we all freak out or like? Weirdly, I don't think we would freak out. Actually, I mean, I think you kind of think back to sort of other momentous. It's sort of news, isn't it, for about a week. Um, <laughs> And then I think it will all blow over. It would be the Big Brother house again, wouldn't it? It will all blow over. I mean, I think, basically, we have been in that situation before. We have been in a situation, you know, where people said, hang on a minute, I can see, stu I can see stuff on, you know, I can see canals on Mars. I think there's aliens up there. Do you know what I mean? I think, I think we've, we've found them. I think we're in. We've got them. We've got the aliens. And it blew over. You know, I mean, it's sort of... Uh, it, it's, it, it's a really, really fascinating question. I think it would soon be... I think we'd find it... We would digest it culturally and spiritually fairly rapidly, I think. Yeah. Of course, it depends, you know, uh, if, if it's openly hostile. <laughs> and it's coming to get us. <laughs> Don't worry about that, seriously. Uh, then maybe it might be different. But, yeah. but the very existence of it, you know, say we find oxygen on a nearby sun, you know, uh, on a nearby, on a super Earth orbiting a K type star, um, you know, whatever, 30, 30 light years away, I don't think anyone's going to. No, I don't think anyone's going to throw their toys out of the pram. But well, thank you. Listen, we, we have run out of time, well, sadly. Um, so I think, uh, first of all, thank you all for your questions. Uh, ben will be signing books outside, so I, I think will. you should all go and get your, 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 your copy. Um, but in the meantime, please join me in thanking Ben for a wonderful hour and a half centre time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. I can't believe I explained uh, the carbon residence. You did it brilliantly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>